And welcome back to the Red Man Group. Anthony Dream Johnson here today, Apex Alpha Male, Red Pill Giga Chad. Uh, with the show's been on hiatus for about five months, as you can guess, due to this little booby monster who was born uh, July 20th, 2023. She's just over two months old now, my beautiful baby girl, Charlotte Dream Johnson. Say hi, Charlotte. Hi. Goochie goo. No. She's not going to be on the show for too long, but I did want to show it to you guys. The channel's been kind of uh, quiet past few months, and, as well as the show. Oh, what's the matter? Uh, basically, she's the uh, reason I focused on her and protecting my family from what I call medical idiots uh, on a good day. Uh, both the birthing process leading up to that and then after, so I've been super focused on that. We'll get more into that in a future video. Today's episode ah. is 182 with Dr. Sean T. Smith, returning guest to the show. We're going to be focusing, what do you think, Charlotte, of the book? You want to read it? We're going to be focusing on Sean's new book, Gatekeeper, The Tactical Guide to Commitment. Ah! Babe, can you take her in a minute? Yeah, come grab her. I'm going to actually pass Charlotte off, guys. Say, say goodbye. Hey, look up. She's really hungry. She's a little booby monster. Go get milk from Mama. Bye, Charlotte. We'll bring her back on later a little bit. Anyway. Before we bring on the guest too, the real guest, not just my daughter, Gatekeeper, the Tactical Guide to Commitment. The title of the show actually came from the back, which I love. I talked about this in my newsletter, Relationships Have Consequences. That's a play on a popular manosphere trope. I don't think it came from the manosphere that choices have consequences. Relationships are one of the ultimate choices you'll ever make in your life. They can bring you up, make your life a lot better, or they can tear you down in a toxic one and ruin your life. Before I bring on the guest, shout out to our sponsor, Tactical Alpha Male Pheromone Soap. You can actually uh, buy this in the link below and support the show. Use coupon code 21C for an extra exclusive discount. It's filled with alpha male pheromones, so if you rub them all over your body, you'll be even more alpha, 200% more alpha. And your chick will smell them in her nostrils and you'll be like, you know, you'll be like a god to her, basically. Alpha male, apex alpha male. <laughs> anyway. Uh, without further ado, please help me welcome back to the show, Mr. Sean T. Smith. Doc Smith, how you doing, buddy? Good. How you doing, Anthony? Doing pretty good, man. It's good we to see you. We got to talk. Uh, yeah, good yeah, to absolutely. see the little, the little baby. Yeah. Yep. And I appreciate, like I said, too, the gift you got her and stuff. We use it every day. Appreciate oh, sure. that. Hey, let me Doc? tell you something I've noticed with, with dudes and their infant children. Shoot. Um, that... Sometimes, here's what I've seen a few times, that guys will get kind of insecure because they'll notice they don't have quite the same emotional connection as to their infant children as the mother does. And some guys will get kind mm -hmm. of nervous about that. You and I were chatting earlier, you were holding her, that obviously doesn't apply to you, but some guys get a little nervous about that. And, and the thing to know if you're a, a guy with an infant baby is that infants are boring if you're a dude, pretty much, because they don't do much. And we love them, but they're boring. But when that personality starts to come online and they start having a little back and forth with you, that's when fathers really get connected to their to their children usually. Yeah, I believe so, it. I mean, I feel like, you know, I love her so much. It's uh, it's indescribable how much like as much as I thought I loved Alyssa, like having the baby. It's it's funny because I saw I put in the newsletter. Maybe you saw that I was reading how having a baby uh, for a man, basically your testosterone can dip for a few months after you're born. Mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe, and maybe you think the same, there's an evolutionary uh, adaptation to that or benefit to that. So you're a little bit calmer, you're a little bit less aggressive, a little bit more nurturing and stuff. I don't really know if that applied to me though, because since she's been born leading up to it and then after, I feel like 10 times more aggressive. And this has probably come through on my newsletter. She doesn't get any of that obviously as an infant baby, but it feels like my protective instinct has like just skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. And Michael Foster warned me about this two months ago, even when Alyssa was pregnant, that I would feel that. I think he would see it kind of in my tweets, which got increasingly more intense um, with hyperbole and satire uh, and even ideas, too. It's not all just a joke. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been interesting to, to read about that testosterone dipping, but it feels like almost like the opposite uh, from my own perspective. You're starting to fade out just a bit. Oh, the audio? Yeah. Uh, I'll work on that. Uh, any better? Yeah, let's give it a shot. Yeah. Let me know again if you can see that. Guys, too, in the comments, if you hear, like, audio issues, just let me know. Got a bunch of... Oh, here's Tony Bruno. Tony Surfer. What's up, bro? Yep. So, anyway, let's talk about your book. 
Um, you can hear me okay? Yeah. So obviously your book is the ta- uh, gatekeeper. I'm used to saying the tactical guide to women. No, it's gatekeeper now. The tactical guide to commitment. It's a follow-up to an earlier book the tactical guide to women. I have no more. My sound is still rough. Yeah, you're kind of fading out. I don't know if it's everybody or just me, but you're you're dropping out a bit. Yeah, it's weird. Hmm. Well, now it sounds better. Yeah. How about now? Any better? Worse. Oh damn! It's like going to the eye doctor one or two. This is great radio. <laughs> I'll work on it in a minute once I get you talking. I have an idea of what I can do with it. But talk to me about your book itself. Like, what led to the writing of this book? This is brand new. Uh, where did this book come from? It's pretty thick, too. I think it's, uh, it's about 200 pages or so. Yeah, so it's... What's it's, the inspiration? It's longer than uh, The Tactical Guide to Women. It's about a, probably a third longer because um, there's a lot more to put in it. It, it. it was almost twice as long. At one point, I cut it back quite a bit. But... This is the book that really should have come before The Tactical Guide to Women because that one was about women. It was, it was, the first third of that book was about you, the reader, but it was mostly about how to determine if a woman is, is, uh, has basic competence to be able to participate in a grown-up relationship. This one is exclusively about you, the reader, why it is that, that we have the relationship patterns that we have and how to break out of them if they're not working for us and how to establish good ones. So. First book was about women, partly. This one's about you. So this one really should have come first because it's, it's all about how you work. Sorry, I was working on my audio. Sound any better? Hey, you're quiet now. Oh, shit. Man, I feel like I'm out of practice. It's like there all the go. same equipment, but yeah. We'll keep working on it. Okay, yeah, that's better. Whatever you're doing now. Yeah. So basically, this book is, uh, you're saying it should have come before the Tactical Guide to Women, but that's mostly what you've been known for in the manuscript, too. I mean, the book like really took off years ago, and it's been, I'd say, a bestseller ever since. Yeah, it's done well. And somebody really complimented it a few weeks back. They said that it has become an underground classic in men's spaces, which yes. is, I mean, that's, that's, to me, is much more valuable than a New York Times bestseller or whatever to know that guys actually value this and this is a book that gets talked about in men's yeah. groups and so forth yeah what i always liked about your first book tactical guide to women is that it was i've said it before and i'll say it again it was like it, it has been one of the best books you can recommend that has anything to do with like manosphere type topics and obviously you're aware of that kind of movement and community and stuff like that but also it's not weird it's not hard to read. It's well written. Other guys can't even write at all, as we've talked about in private. These goofballs. There's no weird acronyms in the book, really. It's like simple. It's easy to understand. You're an incredible writer, too, by the way. Like one of the things I do when I read a book is I think about what the psychology, so to speak, the personality and the soul of the person who wrote it. Like what went into this? What kind of ideas led to this? What kind of life experiences? And what kind of man is actually writing the book? And when I read your book, I feel like more intelligent the more I read it. Um, not oh, thanks. the ideas, but because of the way you write, it's like a look into your mind. Well, That's I appreciate I that. I don't know if looking into my mind is the, the best thing to do, but <laughs> yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. And the weird thing about the tactical guide to women is that I had no idea about the red pill community. I had heard the word manosphere. I didn't know what it was. I thought it's where guys talked about fishing and so forth. I, I really had no exposure to the manosphere in these online spaces and then wrote that book people started getting a hold of it. And that's when I started it. That's when I discovered the red pill. And that's when I started really checking into these concepts like hypergamy that they were talking about all the time and, and so forth. Yeah. You have a great uh, video too on that 45 minutes long criticizing or examining, um, maybe it's a better word. The manosphere is like conventional definition of hypergamy, which is an expanded use well beyond how it was traditionally used in like sociology and stuff. And you debunked, I think, a lot of bad ideas that have percolated uh, in the manosphere over the past couple of years in that video. That's on 21 Studios and your channel. Yeah, and that video, I wasn't tearing down hypergamy, but it, I did kind of break it, break it down because I spent a lot of time thinking about it because of the things that I was hearing in the red pill community about the way women behave, yeah, some of it was making sense. I'd say about 40, 50% of it was making sense, but it conflicted with what I knew as a clinician and what I'd learned in, in, all, in all of my training. And so when I see two things that make sense, 
but they conflict. Like my mind just latches onto that. And so that's where that, that video came from. And I would say that, um, I didn't de I didn't, um, try to tear down the idea of hypergamy, but I did tear down the idea that it, it has become this entire theoretical framework that it was, it was never mm -hmm. meant to be. I mean, hypergamy doesn't even get mentioned in the literature, in the, in the um, evolutionary psychology literature, mm. for example, it barely gets mentioned. The reason it doesn't get mentioned is because it's, it's boring. Like women want the best man they can get. Okay. Like w we all know that we've always known that my grandpa knew that everybody knows that, but then it got turned into, um, well, it's like a blunt force hammer that's used on everything in the manosphere. Yeah, yeah. It's like this tool that just, every woman gets hit with hypergamy, like she has no other fundamental beliefs or motivations for how she behaves. Yeah, and that's the real problem is that hypergamy is one selection factor among many, and it's a relatively minor one. So if you want to talk about how women and men select each other, there's things like assorted of mating for um, emotional disposition and intelligence, intellect. People select each other on intellect very reliable reliably like you don't see a really uh, mm. a high iq person with a low I, lower iq person you just don't see it very often and when you do see it i've seen it on occasion it's miserable for everybody so there wow. are major selection factors like that hypergamy is one minor factor among a hundred others that only explains a little bit of how women select men and it's not mm. irrelevant but it's not real big but then the red pill took it to mean extended it to explain not to be not just a selection factor, but something that explains how women behave after they've committed to a man. There's, there's nothing there that, that can justify expanding it in that direction. And I think that's really what I, I tried to take apart in that video, because if you're thinking about women incorrectly and you're actually in a relationship with with a individual women and you're applying this bizarre template that applies to all women then mm -hmm. you're going to fuck up your relationship so why would you why would you do this that, that's really what i was after in that video there's a lot of self-destructive behaviors in the manosphere i mean especially the red pill wing but others too i mean i could talk about the MGTOWs lately my patience has run out for them over the past uh, couple months and couple years really especially past couple months though i'd say but I think part of why your video is made too, if I can comment on it, I think that the manosphere is very anti-establishment and I've always liked that. It's always been like that. Even in the pickup artist days in the 2000s, it was like that. It was this underground thing and it was very critical of this mainstream dating advice and what we'd call blue pill, mm -hmm. you know, kind of propaganda these days. But I think something got lost in the mix and that was this distrust of the science which is often like really goofy and kind of retarded. Like you criticize the APA all the time, mm -hmm. which should be in theory, a preeminent source of science and scientific method and inquiry and pursuing the truth aggressively and not have this like woke propaganda and indoctrination and ideology in it. And I think you've been really explicit about that. But anyway, the manosphere and it's like distrust of establishment thinking and conventional science it then gets into like just rampant pseudoscience and that mm -hmm. just runs like a virus that just takes off and you have all these zoomer kids that can't even read then they're like yeah i'm a red pill expert alpha male and i'm a i'm gonna uh master hypergamy by super chatting people on youtube and it's like yeah. this is just this has just gotten so dumb yeah i think that's really insightful that that um the red pill is anti-establishment. That's one of the things that really drew me to that crowd to want to have conversations with, with the red pill crowd is that yeah. I can't stand aspects of my, my profession. And I actually haven't yelled at the APA for a while. I need to get back to doing that because they, they need somebody yelling at them. But yeah, um, it, it has turned into kind of a cartoon of itself lately because it's gone down this path of rampant opposition to, like you're saying, rampant opposition yeah. to anything that kind of makes sense in the world. Yeah, there's the distrust of mainstream science has gotten super aggressive and it's not always warranted. Like there is a lot of goofy stuff and ideology, but then you don't just get to make up your own science. I mean, Tony, I think, nails it here with the word he just made up, probably hypergatory. Or that he made <laughs> up himself. Yeah, like purgatory where guys get stuck and they really do. And it, whether it's by design of some charlatan or it's just incidental to people with uh, to men, to content creators that have their own dysfunctions and mental health problems, I would say, God complexes and cult, these little micro cults that they make up. Um, yeah, they, get, they really get stuck in this cycle of hypergatory, this like uh, 
it's like a feedback loop where you just never escape or like a trauma loop. I think is actually what I've seen someone call it. I don't know if it was you or it's Tony or Michael Foster, somebody like that. Yeah, probably not me, but I like that word because you see guys th thinking about one variable. Trauma these, or hypergatory? With hypergamy. They're thinking about one variable oh. and applying it to these multivariate, wonderful creatures, women. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like looking at, I, I don't know. It's like it's looking at, at, a, at a beautiful work of art and just focusing on the color blue that's in it and ignoring everything else. Uh, that's not a great metaphor, but you get no, it's, it's good. It's good enough. It is. No, I, I get it. Yeah. You know, I, I like, um, I'm going to screw up his name, but I'm, you have not been super active in the manosphere because you've been focusing on your book, I think. So like criticizing the APA, your YouTube channel, you have a lot of fans on your channel that have been, they're waiting for you to make a comeback. 20,000 of them on your channel. They love you. Yeah. Um, but, I got to get something going there. But in the meantime, there has been someone else who's come up, Orion, your friend, Orion Torban, Taraban? Taraban, yeah. Taraban, yeah. yeah. And he's been actually blowing up on YouTube. His channel is really catching the algorithm right or just a new audience or whatever. I don't even know. He has probably 300,000 subscribers now or somewhere he's, in that he's direction. coming up on it, yeah. He's he's yeah. really blown up. And he's he's an interesting dude. And, and if you haven't heard of him, um, you should definitely check him out. Yep. He's got some interesting things to say. And... Um, he's a licensed psychologist and he's a really smart dude, super articulate, yep. super yep. smart. Like he can take all, all kinds of variables and, and condense them down, find, find the, uh, core to all of them and talk about the core, talk about what matters in a situation. And, you know, I don't agree with everything he says. And I think that's, that's the mark of somebody who's really interesting and really thoughtful is that I can be on board with him 80% of the time. And then 20% mm -hmm. of the time he's making me think like, okay, am I wrong about this? Or is, or is he, is he missing something? And I just, I love listening to the guy and he's, he's a really smart dude. And he's, I would call him pretty red pill in the classical sense of the term, not the clown show that it is today, but somebody who actually um, thinks about what's going on around them and tries to find the themes. And he can also connect it to the science because he knows the science. Yeah. Well, by science, you mean the purple pill, obviously. Yeah, well, when, yeah, that's a good point. What do I mean by science? Usually, when I when I talk about the science of mating, I'm usually talking about um, evolutionary psychology because I think that's a pretty good framework. It's not perfect, but yeah. you also have people out there like John Gottman. He's up, he's good up to a point. He gives guys advice that sometimes backfires on them because he's very much in the feminine frame, and you, you can you can hear that in in the way he speaks. But he also he on, sees the masculine side. And, is he on YouTube? No, he's uh he's an old school guy. He's oh. if you ever heard heard someone talk about the four horsemen like there's stonewalling and resentment and, and a couple others, these 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 uh behaviors that infiltrate a relationship and, and spell the doom of the relationship, that comes out of his work and he's been around since the seventies. Wow. Yeah. Cool. But anyway, I mentioned uh your friend Orion, uh I'm saying that right again. Yeah. Um he did a couple of, I've seen, you know, several of his videos since finding him. I found, I think, I think I found him because I was searching your name on YouTube for like interviews and I saw that he had interviewed you and I was like, oh, look at this, you know, nice content creator who's not a weirdo and not a goofball and not yeah. a cartoon making real content with real ideas and actually seems to care about the issues. Yeah. Like that's what everyone thinks content creators are. And it's like, man, you have no idea. Um, but he made a video specifically criticizing the red pill, particularly like the clown show of these like, these podcasts where they bring on prostitutes and OnlyFans girls and like all this stuff. And it's just like a circus uh, of goofiness and, and people pretending to be things that they're not in your book. Even you call them uh, social media charlatans and Lamborghinis. I think is one of the Something ways. Like that, right? yeah. yeah. I'm not that far into the book, by the way, nowhere near what I want it to be. Anyway, I'm about 50 pages in and it's okay. over 260. I actually just checked. So I did not get as much done as I wanted to reading it, but I still want right. to talk, keep talking about it as much as we can. You got your hands full. It, it's okay. Yeah. 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 It's been, that's something I need to do my own video blogs about or kind of newsletters or something. But yeah, becoming a father has, has major change in your life. And I would have said that even before the fact, obviously, but there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path uh, as like the old saying from the matrix goes or any, probably a bunch of other people too. Anything surprise you about it so far? I don't even know. I'm still like, yeah. it's, it's been two months, but it feels like it's been two days. Like it went by, it's gone by so fast. We look at pictures of her pictures from when she was born, like her first bath versus like, you know, the other day and she's huge. She's mm -hmm. gained like 
six pounds. She's du- she's almost double the weight, her own body weight in two months and super healthy and all that. But you're just seeing her grow like she's not the same baby anymore. And the first couple days you get her home and the first week and two weeks, like she's still, you know, super tiny. But then she hits like nine pounds and 10 pounds and yeah. 11 pounds and 12 pounds. But it yeah, just it's, gets it's, worse. You're going to turn around. She'll be a senior in high school. Everybody says that. But man, it's it's 100 yeah. percent true. Yeah. You, you don't know how fast time slips through your fingers until you have a kid. That's when you really get it. Yeah. No, I believe it. I mean, when I was young, I remember people telling me that as you get older, time goes faster. I did not understand that at 16. I definitely understand that at 35. And with the kid, I can see that too. Like I've always heard that, you know, that kind of idea that a kid will make things go a little faster. I've seen that just in two months and it's like, holy crap. And that's just one kid. You know, you and I know you have uh, one child too, I believe. Yeah. But we know guys that have four or five, six, seven kids, Michael Foster, Tanner Guzzi, Elliot Hulse. Um, I grew up in a large family too, but I wasn't a parent, obviously. I was just one of the kids. And now... I have a lot more respect basically for guys who have a bunch of kids, which is what I want, like a platoon. Yeah. But I'm also being confronted with the reality of handling even one child. Uh, you know, along I still have obviously the moms around too, we're together. Yeah, but I can't even imagine. Come, I hope. Oh hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. Alyssa's nervous, like she wants to wait like a year, and I'm like, Yeah, that's fine. They recommend eighteen months, you know, I don't really care. But I definitely want to have a bunch. And um, because I'm an apex alpha male, I don't marry 50 year old single mothers like other manosphere guys. So she's got plenty of breeding time left in her, you know, <laughs> breeding time. OK, <laughs> <laughs> the breeding window, like, but she yeah. still has eggs, you know, as Molly knew, Stefan Molly knew, might say her eggs are not dead yet. They're still fresh, fresh eggs, fresh eggs. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Your book, too, though, has really got me th- thinking a lot about the relationship. Um, obviously this has been a topic on my mind for a couple of years since I met Alyssa and we started dating and then we got engaged, but it's been, it's just been awesome to read your book because it makes me think about all the different issues. Like what can I improve? What can be better? Why did we come together? Um, what has been really, you know, are we similar? Are we different? Like how does that all work? And the truth is that we're very similar and your book has made me realize that even more and appreciate that even more. Yeah, the, the real focus of the book is um, what is this relationship bringing into your life? And yeah, um, I was real heavy on that message in early drafts. I was separating the relationship from the person. And what, I had some people read it and they pointed out that was, that was a little too, com- it was just a little too complicated and more complicated than it needed to be. So I talk about the relationship and what it brings into your life without really separating the two, but they really are two separate entities. There's the woman that, that you're with, and then there's the relationship that the two of you created. Mm-hmm. And I talk about the qualities that this relationship should be bringing into your life. It should be bringing, bringing composure rather than chaos. Like you've talked publicly about the chaos that you grew up in and, and how much work it is to overcome that. It should be bringing that. It should be bringing dignity rather than shame. Cause you walk around, mm-hmm. you, see, you know, you look around, you see guys that are just beaten into submission by their women. Like they're, they're, they're just driven by shame. And what I mean by that is shame is this emotional system that is meant to make you get small and get quiet so that you don't keep uh, making the same mistakes. So the way shame works is you, you sense that somebody out there in your community is upset with you. You put the brakes on, you slow down, you stop doing everything so that you can figure out what it is that is making them angry. You That's what shame does. And you see guys that are just driven by this constantly. So it should not be bringing that. It should be bringing a sense of dignity where you, this relationship helps you walk through the world with your head high, like you coming on here today with your little baby and talking about how well things are going at home and how you've grown as a man because of that. Like you're not getting smaller because of this relationship. You're getting bigger because of this relationship. Relationships should bring that. It should bring um, resilience. It should make you a stronger person rather than a weaker person. That's another thing you see in a lot of guys. You see that they, Mm -hmm. they're in the wrong relationship and they start to look physically smaller than they are. You see yeah. guys that are that are beaten down and like they they age too fast and they're unhealthy. And well, their they're, posture will change they, very quickly if they changes. be. Yeah. Yeah. You can I've see seen that. The, yeah. You can even see that Rivalino you probably see on Twitter, the green lines guy who draws mm-hmm. all these green lines on celebrities and manager guys, all, yeah. all kinds of people. No one's off limits with that guy. I love it. But you see the body language really is what he's pointing out. And you see these men who are, they do get smaller, especially I think you're saying over time too. Yeah. And the woman will hold them different and then she'll change her posture relative to him differently. 
And these are the signs. He's he's basically pointing out in a cartoonish way that these relationships are not healthy. At least it, in my opinion, in a way, that's what he's doing really, really well. And the, the body language and the posture are a really good example of that. Your body, you know, uh, your body speaks, you know, a million words a minute. And you're, that's kind of a goofy way to put it. But like a picture says a thousand words, your body language says probably 10,000. There's a lot more going on. We communicate non-verbally. I don't know what the percentage is, but I think there's, I think that number's pretty high. People looking into that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you can see when a guy's losing his resilience in a relationship. And I love Revelina. I, 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 um, I follow him on Twitter. We've, we've had a little back and forth here and there. But one of yeah. the reasons I like him is because if I look at, old pictures of my wife and me like it's, it's perfect like i would pass his test i'm standing straight i'm not doing the cock shaming that he calls it like i'm standing straight and she's turned toward me and she's got her arms around me she's not doing the claw and so mm -hmm. i yeah i don't know if what he says he's he's half joking i think but half telling half serious and yeah one of the reasons i like him i guess is because i look at my old pictures and i pass his test um so yeah for whatever that's worth i don't know if it's worth anything but it's I think it is. I think, you know, there's been psychologists that go after him, I think, in the in the media and like the news has gone after yeah. him and this kind of stuff. They try to make a big deal out of it. But I really think he's onto something. It's a very loose science. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not this is not a rigorous scientific method, but just analyzing how people behave. And you see it, too, like with celebrities all the time. I think there's a bunch of ones he does of like Will Smith. And these people have been through mm -hmm. very publicly abusive, toxic relationships. And you see the way they carry themselves and you see the way the woman carries herself. How does she show her legs and her, her body and her hands and her arms? How does she treat the guy? There's a lot to it. Yeah. I think that's why people, he's caught people's attention because there is something to it. And everybody knows there's something to it. Yeah. 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 So I have some questions I want to get into for the book uh, a little bit more specifically. Um, let's talk about love. I think there's a whole section towards the end of the book where it says love is not enough. Mm -hmm. But love is also a word, and I think you'll agree, that you know, you rarely hear in the manosphere. Like, I, I don't remember the last time I heard the word love mentioned in the manosphere. It's been years, at least in terms of like a video broadcast somewhere. So there's like this very, you have a bunch of guys who come in and they're the walking wounded. They want answers about male female relationships, uh, including stuff like love. Is it okay to love a woman? Is it what about romantic love? How important is it? Is it enough? Is it not enough? But then they're like deathly afraid of it. Um, so can you talk to me about your views of love as a psychologist and how, how it's entered in the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I handled it in a very specific fashion in the book. And what I did with it is um, the book is organized around these five concepts. There's composure, dignity, resilience, joy, and love. These are things that a relationship, if you're going to commit yourself to a woman, these are the things that you should get in return. Guys, guys tend not to think in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm going to give my commitment. What do I get in return for my commitment? And I'm encouraging guys to think about it in sort of that, that, um, transactional nature at first. And the way I handle yeah. love in the book is I don't even talk about it. I mentioned it in the introduction, but then I say in the introduction, we're not going to talk about love again until the very last chapter, because guys, and this has been documented pretty well, that guys will fall for women more quickly than women fall for men. We get possessive, we get, we get attached, we want them in our lives. And so um, we, will, we will fall in love with a woman and then we will forget about what it is that this relationship is bringing into our lives. So we forget about composure, dignity, resilience, joy. And the way I handle love in the book is to put it at the very last and say, we're not even gonna talk about it until we talk about these other things that have to be present in a relationship before you take love into consideration because you may love her but that's not enough if this relationship is tearing you down. And that's how I handle it in the book. Yeah. Well put. I haven't gotten to that section yet at the end, but I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, love is not enough if it's tearing you down, if it's toxic. Uh, in the beginning of the book, too, you actually get into kind of a rough overview of the human brain. And you try to basically help men begin to unravel uh, emotional thinking, like hindbrain stuff, versus forebrain, like logical thinking. And using your brain specifically in the forebrain to make better long-term decisions. Can you actually give us a brief overview of the human brain in this, the same way you did in the book or for yeah, the guys who are not I, familiar with these ideas? It's a theme I returned to throughout the book, but I, the first part of the book is kind of heavy on how, how the mind works and how it will, it will screw you and then push you toward the wrong relationships. And it's basically that the mind is 
divided against itself. And I mm-hmm. could give an hour long lecture on how the mind is divided against itself down all the way down to the level of neurons, individual neurons, gating neurons in your spine and neurons, gating neurons in your brain that make decisions when you have competing signals. So the, you'll have competing signals coming from different, different areas. For example, here's one little kid is running around, falls down, skins his knee. So mom or dad picks up the kid and what does he do? Starts rubbing the back. Well, why would you rub the back? The back didn't get hurt. The knee got hurt. And the reason you rub the back, we don't know this, but we've evolved to do this, is it creates a competitive signal. So you have pain signals coming from the knee, but then if you're rubbing the back, that causes interference. So in the spine, you have neurons that are having to decide do I put the pain signal through or do I put the pleasure signal through? And it doesn't make the pain stop, but it helps. And so that's an example of our central nervous system competing with itself at a very basic level. I don't go into that in the book, but interesting, uh, interesting though, because that's actually used in birthing these days. Uh-huh. The, this, this exact phenomenon you're talking about, the trying to flood the CNS with basically through massage techniques, massage, uh-huh. like little thumpers, percussion, whatever they're using. This is what duels and stuff will do when a woman's in pain giving birth. Yeah, uh, this the exact same process. You're creating you're creating competition, and so the all from the cellular level all the way up to modules of the brain competing with each other. So for, mm-hmm. I do give an example in the book of of a mice a mouse experiment where you have the ears of the mice competing with the eyes and overriding what the eyes see, and this is to advance the survival of of the um, of the mouse. But then, really, what matters for the book is that we have at a much higher level we have a, a rational mind that competes with the emotional mind. The problem is the rational mind can't make you feel anything. You can you can know what's right, but it, you can't feel you know you can't really feel that that this is a good thing to do. What's right, but your emotional mind, when it's telling you to do something stupid, it has access to your body, so it can make you feel pain and it can make you feel pleasure, and that's what makes the emotional mind so powerful. And the principles that we learn about relationships when we're little kids. Um, and all the way through our development, it gets wrapped up with our emotional mind. So our emotional mind will compete with the rational mind, even when you know what's right. And it'll try to push, push us in a direction that it thinks is best, whether or not that direction is best for us. Like the, the rational mind can think about the future. The emotional mind thinks about right now. What do I want yeah. right now that's going to advance my survival? It's going to make me feel better. It's going to put me in a better position right now. It's not thinking about tomorrow. So... Yeah. I talk in the book a little bit about how we have this competition going all the time. And, and another theme throughout the book is let's tease out what your emotional mind learned about relationships early on. Because if you know what it taught you early on, then you know what direction it's going to try to push you in going forward. And if that's a good direction, fine. Check that box. Go forward. But if it's pushing you in a direction that is going to work against you, and we all have a little bit of that. Some of us have a lot of it then you bring that out into the light of day. You put words to it. And when you understand what it's doing, why it's doing it, then you can have some options about whether or not you follow the emotional mind. And it gets tough because it's, it's, it's painful sometimes to, mm-hmm. to override your emotional side. But it's part of what a man does is you, you ride through pain and you do what's right. Yeah, the resilience like you talk about. You know, the last part you just mentioned here too, uh, looking back on what your examples were of relationships, what kind of, what kind of actual principles do you have in your mind, whether you're aware of them or not. And I've had to think about that a lot myself over the years, uh, with Alyssa and now with the baby and stuff, because I grew up in a super toxic environment with a super toxic, super toxic example that was present too, was, it was active. A lot of guys in the manosphere didn't have that. They came from Sometimes their parents are married, but a lot of times they come from single mother households and stuff. So they have a fatherlessness issue, but it's the absence of a father completely. Um, I had a really toxic father who's like a violent alcoholic and their relationship corresponded to that for, you know, over for 40 years, they were ended up being married until he died recently. So I've had to kind of unravel in my own head, like, and put, you know, actually think about stuff explicitly, talk about it sometimes and all that with friends and family and stuff about what happened. And then also try to like unravel what those principles were that may have gotten stuck in my head that are just totally fucking dysfunctional. Mm-hmm. Um, and the manosphere help, helps a lot of guys do this, but it can also go off course, like we mentioned, with like this rampant, this total trust of anything that's total trust of anything the counterculture. 
like mainstream is bad. Anything that says mainstream is bad is good. And that is absolutely not how real life works. And the Manosphere is probably one of the one of the shining examples of that over the past couple of years with the clown show dumpster fire that it's become. Yeah. And the Manosphere, when they when they talk about doing the work, they're talking about making money, getting stronger, getting more educated, and that's all good stuff. They don't talk about doing the work of figuring out where you came from so that you don't repeat it. Like you came mm -hmm. from this god awful chaotic environment. And I'm guessing that yep. if you didn't do the work of dissecting that and figuring out what you learn from that, then some aspect of that you'd be prone to repeating and, and recreating yeah. in your life. And totally, the totally. Manosphere, and this, it's not really a feature of the manosphere that they don't do this. It's a feature of people that we don't do this. It, it's not, we're not really inclined to look inward and say, okay, what is my compulsion to repeat here? Yeah. You got, you got to do that work too. Yeah. Actually, uh, this is a question I had for written down a little bit later, but we'll get into it now because you just brought up something very relevant to it. Um, about a month ago, a month and a half, Pat Stebman, our very good friend, the world's number one hypergamy coach, dating coach, <laughs> uh, coach yeah. Pat Stebman, <laughs> he, um, he did a really good tweet. It was a long tweet too. It wasn't a short, it was like one of the extended ones, uh, discussing how the manosphere has become a place where a lot of men really are not interested in change, uh, in any meaningful way. And so you hear these, th these phrases and kind of this hyper reality, I would call it of do the work, do the work, do the work. And on the surface level, these are good messages. And like men should do the work, like get up, go to the gym, do it once a week forever or twice a week forever, like for years and years and years, change your diet, actually make the changes you need to do. Go out and talk to a bunch of women. Like this is hard work. It takes time, mm -hmm. time and effort. It could be, uh, it could be emotional. It can be painful getting rejected by women, getting drinks thrown on you. Who, who knows? All kinds of crap happens. But Pat's point in the tweet is that the manosphere has become a place where that has really become like sidelined and they don't want to do the work. They don't want to change. They really don't independent of whatever they say. That's just like, that's just hot air. What do they actually do? They just want to bitch about women. They want to super chat, uh, 25 year old bimbos and pretend that they're red pill alpha males and all this like goofy stuff that just makes no sense. And see, I think it's, it's really become a place where we used to call them keyboard jockeys and it, it was like mental masturbation in the old manosphere. But these days that's become like the dominant thing rather than a minority. Uh, that was kept in check. Mm -hmm. So I don't know yeah, if you've and, seen that yourself or you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't aware of the manosphere, the red pill corner and so forth before I wrote the tactical guide to women. I was vaguely aware yeah. of pickup artistry and I had mixed feelings about pickup artistry because it can get real dark real quick. It can get manipulative and evil, but yep. there are some good coaches out there. There's some good pickup artists out there that, and, and what they're mm -hmm. doing, what yeah, what they what I was noticing then, and I'm sure what some of them still do is good basic behavioral psychology where, okay, you're anxious about something, good, go out and do it now. So let, let's come up with a strategy. If you're anxious about approaching women, let's come up with a strategy for you to expose yourself to that anxiety. They don't talk about it in those terms, but you expose yourself to that anxiety. You go out and you experience that a thousand times. And then guess what? Your anxiety, you get some mastery over it. And they didn't speak yeah. about it in psychological terms, but that's what they were. That's what some of them do is good behavioral psychology for anxiety. That's exactly what I did for years. And that was heavily encouraged. I mean, the old man is the manosphere. I've been around for 18 years, really observing it, participating in it, making content, whatever, mostly conferences and speeches from the conferences, but other stuff too. And yeah, in the old, there's basically, I've been around so long. I've seen cycles of it, like multiple cycles, like five year cycles of like, what's new, what's trending, what's repeating or echoing from 10 years ago. Like these, these guys these days have no idea because it's gotten so big and it's so fresh in their minds, but I'm like. I'm so young, but I feel so old sometimes. I'm like these young whippersnappers who are like 29 years old. I'm like, you goofy, goofy guys. But anyway, the old manosphere was aggressively pro getting guys out of the house, going to talk to women and exposing yourself to those social and emotional risks mm -hmm. of confronting things that are scary to you. Like, oh, you're scared to talk to women? Just admit it and then go talk to a thousand women. I talked to like, I approached personally like almost 7,000 women from 2006 until 2020, about 2020 when COVID hit. And that's a lot. And that's more than most guys ever talked to in their life. But by exposing myself to exactly what you're talking about, I desensitized myself to that. And this is totally common in the old manosphere. This was mm -hmm. like the, the thing you had to do. And if you didn't, 
you got made fun of, you were shamed, stop being a beta, stop being a goofball, get out of the house, stop writing, go talk to women, then come back and talk or write whatever you want. There was like, basically there was, uh, there was masculine standards that you had to be held up to. Mm -hmm. And this is why, even though I would anger, just like these days I piss everyone off in the sphere. This was no different in like 2007, but there was a level of respect that I had because I was so aggressive in going out and they love that as a role model for other young men because that's what, exactly what they wanted all the young guys to do mm -hmm. back when the manosphere was a little bit healthier place. Yeah, and so you go out and you you approach 7,000 women and at the end of that, you're no longer afraid to approach women. But I'm going to mm -hmm. guess that that's a skill that generalizes to other areas because the, yes. the real skill is facing anxiety. Really, it has nothing to do with women. It has to do with identifying something out there that scares you and looking at it and moving toward it. And yep. there are still guys out there. Like we were talking about Rivolino earlier. He posted um, on Twitter something this week about having social courage. It was a great tweet about go out and do things that scare you. And his examples weren't even about women. They were um, go take a tennis class and look like a goofball. Go you know, invite, you know, throw a party and invite people over and risk that no one's going to show up. Um, and there was a third one that he gave where it was just like embrace your anxiety. And it was a great yeah. tweet. And that's the part of the manosphere that, that I like. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the, he's definitely one of the better guys and he's anonymous and whatnot. That's okay. Uh, it's not the end of the world, but yeah, there's still some good guys and he's definitely one of the, he's a bigger account too. He's got probably 200 K people following him now, yeah. which I love to see. I love, I love, uh, real people, real ass mofos, uh, crudely speaking that post real content and have real ideas and are not just like theory jockeys. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah I think, sure. I think, I think with approaching women, it, it brings me back to what you're talking about in the beginning of the book with, using your forebrain to conquer or manage your decisions better you like conquer the hindbrain like yeah you're scared like yeah like your brain is wired to not talk to women you don't know because you might get killed and for a lot a long period of human history you definitely could get killed you definitely could talk to the wrong woman or make the wrong move and get hit over the head with a rock and that's it there's no cops there's no hospital you just die and it can the still story. happen on occasion so yeah back when we oh were totally not under the rule of law yeah i imagine it happened much more frequently. Yeah. And that's what our brains adapted to though and evolved to, as I understand it. This is the, and the old manister too would talk about this. This was the old pickup artists like mystery and those kind of guys, they would talk about this all the time and it would help guys though, understand it and then kind of get over it. And yeah, I don't, uh, God, I talked to so many women over all, this, all those years. It was got ridiculous, but it was useful. And like you said, it, it would, uh, spill over to other areas of life. I think it improved vastly my public speaking ability. Like public speaking oh, sure. would give me more social courage and was its own challenge. And that would spill over into just like talking to women at a bar, but then talking to 2000 women that would then spill over back to public speaking. Mm -hmm. So people wonder like how I got into public speaking. It's through the events, but then I got better at it just by talking in like different social situations. Yeah. Anytime you face anxiety, you get better at facing anxiety. It's like learning to play the piano. Facing anxiety is a skill that you can develop like anything else. Mm -hmm. By the way, we got a super chat from Don Juan Plagas Zero. I don't know what's going on with his name, but appreciate the five bucks. Never forget, Sean beat Trollo in a debate. Ooh. That's true. Uh, the grandmother of the Manosphere, Trollo, uh, Rollery, Tomasi, yeah. I call him like Hillary. Yeah. Dr. Smith, have you heard of psychologist Mac and Murphy? If so, what's your take on him? Thank you. I have not heard of this person. Somebody I need to look into, apparently. Yeah. Uh, have Don Juan, of, I have not. Okay. I have not. Most of the psychologists I know are named Sean Smith. Uh, and then your buddies who are therapists like Ken Curry, Robert Glover, a few more. Um, that one guy wrote The uh, the Body Keeps a Score. I like him a lot. He's a psychiatrist. Uh -huh. What's his name? He's a German guy. Van der Kolk. Bessel van der Kolk. Yeah, Bessel van der Kolk. Yeah, yeah, I like him a lot. And obviously the YouTube's number one psychology guru, Richard Grannon. Yeah, he's, he's fun <laughs> to listen to. I like him. Yeah. Unstoppable too. It keeps going. So in, in getting back to this thing of conquering anxiety, one of the things I talk about, well, the, the major theme in the book probably is let's figure out what it is about you. What specifically, what is it that your emotional mind is afraid of and what is it drawn to? And mm. if it's afraid of the right thing and drawn to the right thing, then cool, you're, you're in good. But there's probably something in there that, um, yeah, it might be afraid of, a healthy thing and, and drawn to the unhealthy thing. I, I was certainly drawn to the unhealthy things earlier in life. 
Yeah, same. I've talked about, um, you know, my previous marriage, which is one of the reasons I was so I actually did a lot in your, of what you're I'm not some perfect example role model of what you want guys to do necessarily with this book. But in between my first marriage to a literal prostitute and then meeting Alyssa, I was, you know, out approaching women, you know, so, so to speak, dating women very short term and all this kind of stuff. But I was also very, very, very protective of my commitment. Like I refused to like even Alyssa had to fight like hell to be my girlfriend for like over a year. I mean, I really, really, really put her through the ringer, maybe a little too much, but maybe that was for the best as well, uh, because I was so protective of that. I was a huge like man whore uh, in terms of like sexual promiscuity, but in terms of commitment promiscuity, there was none, zero. Mm -hmm. Like you could not get through that because I was so after that experience at Medusa, I was uh, I don't know if scared is the right word, but I was very concerned about getting into another relationship like that that would not be healthy. And that if it did result in marriage, then you have another failed marriage. And as you probably know, every time you get married and divorced, your, prob your probability of getting that, of getting divorced again goes up. And I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to make sure the next time, the next time I got married and the next time I wanted to build a family, I nailed it. Not only for myself, but for my kids. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that in the book too, that guys who are going to make great fathers are thinking about it before the fact. And I definitely was. I, gave, I was giving, she was, you know, cracking up, uh, you know, learning this not too long ago. I started giving her supplements uh, that I thought were useful for fertility and for the health of a baby very soon after I met her, just in the event that I knocked her up or wanted to knock her up on purpose. So either on accident or on purpose, just preemptively uh, kind of doing that. And maybe that's a little bit sociopathic, but she dug it and I didn't even tell her that. I was like, no, you need to eat these supplements, start eating this kind of stuff. Since I'm you thinking were sneaking ahead. it into her spaghetti, you were actually no. giving it to her and saying, take this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Because it would just improve her overall health. And to me, that's one of the most important things you can do for the health of your future children is for you to be healthy. This yeah. is called epigenetics is the kind of, uh, well, number one, the conditions for a woman to get pregnant. You know, you need to raise those as good as you can. You want her body to be healthy to go through a very serious uh, biological event that's like very taxing on her body. But on top of that, both of you want to maximize your own genetic expression. It's important you work out. It's important you eat healthy, not only for yourself, but for your kids. Because it it's uh, it's going to improve gene expression basically, and reduce uh, chances for birth defects and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff I thought about, but these girls never believed it. They just well, assume so it's like alpha giga chat. But I'm like, I need to make sure this girl is healthy and fertile and ready to get knocked up. Yeah. So you're an example of when that statistic is not true. So that statistic that with each successive divorce, the risk of divorcing again goes up, and we know statistically that is very true but and i don't know any research to confirm this but my my observation is that that's true when people don't do the work of figuring out their role in the first marriage or the, or the previous marriage so if they don't do the work of figuring out how they contributed to that outcome then they mm -hmm. just go out and, and they reenact it again but yeah. you you know i've known you for a while and i've, I've watched you working through this and you've, you've worked through it very publicly that you did not want to repeat that first mistake. And yeah. you, came, you came from such chaos that, of course, that's where you ended up, right? Yeah. As, as a younger man. But you saw that happen to yourself, and you've been doing this work that said, I'm, this is not going to happen again. And yeah. I, I've seen you do a, a tremendous amount of work, you know, just from a distance over a period of years. This wasn't a period of two weeks. Like, this, this takes time to overcome yep. where we came from. And so that's how you don't increase the chances of a second divorce. That's how you decrease the chances of a second divorce. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, something you, you just mentioned too, yeah, the childhood home environment was so toxic and so chaotic that of course it's where I ended up marrying a prostitute. Uh, on top of that though, I've, I've mentioned this briefly once years ago with Richard, Richard Cooper actually, when he interviewed me about it, 2017 I think, that living with a woman who was basically a BPD kind of crazy hooker, literally a, a prostitute, that was actually 10 times calmer and less chaotic and smoother, even though it was a dysfunctional, unhealthy relationship relative to what I actually grew up around. Mm -hmm. It was a it was it sounds cartoonish, but it was a major step in the right direction in terms of what I grew up around, which is this absolute drugs and violence, like nonstop cops coming over all the time. Oh, shit, some dropped. Um, so I thought that was that's one of the things I had to figure out. And I didn't understand that early on. 
Like I didn't yeah. just wake up a week after I split up from the swimming and figure this out. It took like a, took like over a year to figure that out. So let me say that back to you and see if I got that right. That what you saw was less unhealthy, but it yes. wasn't unhealthy because you didn't know what healthy was, mm -hmm. which is what this book is about. What is had, healthy? Like had, it's not enough to just know what's not healthy. You got to know yeah. what is healthy, and that's where you that's where you are now is in yeah. the healthy end of the spectrum. I I try. That's the goal. But yeah, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea what a healthy male female adult relationship looked like. All I knew what all I knew is what bad was. Mm -hmm. So I could spot that, but what I grew up around too is also very overt. It was very obviously chaotic and dangerous and violent. And so that's also what led to that Medusa kind of toxic relationship, that marriage, is that a lot of it was very it was a different style I was not familiar with. And so that also was one of the reasons it was inevitable too that I'd find like a super crazy chick who has then had a very covert uh, kind of style and kind of method for the abuse and stuff. Yeah, but it's it was uh, it's been a learning experience, like you said, though, to focus on healthy relationships and, and build them. And that that's another thing that the manosphere, and I want to talk about this with you, that it's almost like, especially with the vasectomy stuff you see recently, there's a lot of like, don't get married. The don't get married stuff is like really taken off even worse than it used to be. Yeah. So it's like, don't have relationships, don't get married, don't co cohabitate ever ever in a million years until the laws all change, all of them, which ones, who knows, but they all have to change before you can cohabitate and get married. Don't yeah. build a family. Don't get a vasectomy in your twenties when you're 25. I mean, this stuff has like gotten just totally nuts. Yeah. And I guess if your goal is you want to eliminate all risk, then I guess you go that direction. But the problem is that when you try to eliminate all risk, you just create other risks. So for example, we know that men who end up alone on average this is not every guy like you can make your own individual choices and defy the statistics but guys who end up alone they they have higher risks of cancer they have a higher risk of illness and and um um <laughs> i can't think of the word which is ironic um probably drug when, abuse when you age and you can't think of words <laughs> Oh, dementia. Uh, yeah, dementia. I was about to say President Biden. What does President Biden have? It's dementia. So, um, yeah. actually, I'm not supposed to say that out loud, but I think we all know it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to say it out loud because I'm a psychologist and I'm not supposed to diagnose. So, forget yeah. that I said that. Uh, but you know, when you try to avoid, when you try to eliminate all risk by isolating, you're just creating the risk that are associated with isolation, which is certain mental and, and physical health problems. And again, yeah. it doesn't mean you're, you're destined to have those things, but there's no free ride in life. So one alternative to trying to eliminate all risk is to try to learn how things work and make the best decisions that you can. And yeah, may, yeah maybe you get burned. Of course, maybe you get burned. That's how the world works. But I mean, you can yeah. hide in your basement for the rest of your life. And that seems to be a lot of what the advice out there, like you got this yeah. pearl chick out there telling, I have no idea what her deal is, but she's telling guys, get a vasectomy, don't get married. You know, what, what the hell? What, what kind well, of she stole it. She stole it from the fraud father. I mean, it wasn't yeah. even her own. A lot of, most of what she does is just parroting other people's stuff, uh, but then kind of hyperbolizing it. But yeah, that comes from other people too. And the fraud father, Rollery, is, is one of them lately. I think he tried walking it back later, you know, when it went, his, his little tweet on getting a vasectomy went viral, really upset. A lot of the conservatives and stuff. But yeah, no, it's just like this, this aggressive all, push to eliminate all risk. It's not healthy. No, it, it is not. Well, I mean, I guess if you want to live in your basement for the rest of your life, that's fine. Uh, that's what a guy wants to do. I'm not here to guy. I'm not here to tell guys to get married or don't get married. Do what you want to do. But what I don't like is when anxiety runs a person's life. Bingo. Yeah. Yep. I think you had just said that really just hit the nail on the head. Cause I've been thinking about this a lot lately with the content creators who promote this stuff. It's not just Pearl. It's not just the fraud father. It's others too, kind of MGTOW guys and stuff like that. And I had a lot of patience for MGTOW cause I wanted to see like how they would evolve over time. Is this little wing of the manosphere going to mature? Is it going to like collapse? What's going to happen with it? And it's just gotten more and more stupid over time. And I think a lot of it is this thing. It, it's run by anxiety. It's like, who are the most beta guys who are the most risk averse and the most anxiety ridden circle jerking each other, excuse my language, into this this cycle of avoid all women, avoid all relationships, avoid building a family until the laws change. Which law? They don't even know what law is, number one. So it's like, what are you talking about? When the laws do change, like in Florida, we just had major updates to alimony uh, laws, divorce laws, other stuff like that, child custody even. Mm -hmm. 
we now have default 50 50 custody which is excellent i think that's the objectively best thing for children and exactly what the government should do we have yeah, that now and i mean a major a step in the right direction for sure yeah it's other stuff not too perfect but yeah you got you gotta acknowledge the successes when they come along and i think you're yeah. saying that a lot of these guys won't even acknowledge the successes because they're so scared yeah. Exactly. It was crickets. I was one of the only guys in the manosphere at promoting uh, or announcing this news that Florida had finally passed major 20 years it took to pass all this stuff, right? Get it signed in the law by the governor and all that. There's You could hear a pin drop in the manosphere when it happened. Yeah. No one was talking about it. Nobody cared because it's not... Uh, it's funny how these manosphere guys will make fun of mainstream news because it's like this negative... Uh, extremely negative cycle of news to get people's attention we're all going to die covid is going to kill us all everything is going to burn down tomorrow we're all doomed and then it's like you do the same thing because you don't ever want to talk about anything positive even with major positive changes for men and fathers in the exact way that you want them to happen you don't even say anything there's no celebration there's no champagne there's not even like oh this is great like let's talk about it nothing it's just silence and it just aggravates the crap out of me yeah. And in that, in that particular case, there's a lot of unsung heroes behind the scenes, because when you think about men's rights activists, you think about the, well, at least I think about the unhinged guys on, on Twitter that they'll come after you if you disagree with any little thing that they say, but the real men's rights activists are the, the people who are working behind the scenes. They're not high profile. They're trying to change laws. They're trying to affect, um, improvements yeah. and they actually succeeded here and we don't even get to know who they are. Um, yeah, I'm sure somebody knows who they are, but they did a hell of a job and I hope they keep going. Yeah. I mean, some of the most powerful guys that actually advocate for men's rights are like that. Carnell Smith is one of them who's spoken at our events a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I met him in 2021. He was very successful in the 2000s at getting laws changed in like uh, six states uh, for paternity laws, paternity fraud and stuff like that. He doesn't have a YouTube channel. He has, I think, like a Facebook account or something. That's about it. He's not big on social media. He doesn't really care. Is what he cared about was activism was actually getting things done like not even just talking about it but like what do i do to actually get this done he was able to do that that's another guy you don't hear enough about even though he's actually one of the few men who went out and got a lot of stuff done yeah i don't so, i don't know his name so yeah, I gotta yeah look into him too yeah he's on the channel you'll see some of his videos have gone viral too some of the shorts and stuff like that yeah yeah he, uh, he had a pretty nasty case of paternity fraud that uh he had to actually get the laws changed to file a lawsuit against uh, the baby mama and he got it worked out in the end he even had the uh the judge who was like mocking him early on at the signing of the law when it when it actually came into law and the judge apologized to him just for mocking being a dick him. yeah kind of i forget i don't know if maybe mocking is not the right word but this judge was like not having it because this case was very legit this woman had defrauded him knowingly for years had written to her friends about defrauding him he brought this into court and he couldn't get anywhere with it like this mm -hmm. is absurd that's what made him so angry. Uh, so yeah, anger anger motivated his his rage to change his laws and change the system, and he did for the better. And then a lot of men benefited from it in Georgia and other states. Yeah, he, his yeah. speeches are on our channel. You guys can check it out if I'm not uh, recounting the story correctly, but I believe that's what happened with him. So a story like his is complicated and it's kind of difficult to tell accurately, and I guess people think it's not that interesting, so it doesn't get out there. But then you have someone like Pearl saying, uh, get a vasectomy. And then that spreads like wildfire. Yeah. Yeah, she's really good at outrage broking. She's, I think she's saying things that she knows are wrong and goofy and stupid. But she knows that if she says them in the right way, that most people are not going to think twice about why she said it. Mm -hmm. And they're just going to complain and they're going to bitch and they're going to outrage and they're going to yell at her and this and that. And this is how your friend, uh, you know, Orion, he's done a video about this. This is why the Red Pill stuff takes off. Because they're just gaming the algorithm and these algorithms by big tech it's a feedback loop mm -hmm. it's not just as goofy stuff going on and it's organically taking off it's that the algorithms designed by big tech these computer programs or these the software is specifically designed to target this kind of stuff and make it spread yeah so that's it's like why this, i ignore i'm talking about her now but i ignore her on, on twitter and everywhere else like yeah she's, she's not worth discussing or retreating or anybody yeah. who says go out and get a vasectomy you know yeah they, des they deserve to be ignored yeah, there's nothing alpha about weeding yourself out of the gene pool, especially in your 20s. I think a lot of doctors won't even give you a vasectomy if you're under 25 because you're basically too young to understand how permanent this is. It's yeah. not really that reversible. We have an yeah. attendee who went through it. He had a vasectomy in uh, early 30s. Then he got it undone in his late 30s. He's attended a couple times at the events. I won't say his name, but you probably met him. 
And it was extremely painful getting it undone. They basically, as he put it, fillet your balls open. And it's expensive. Insurance won't cover it. I think it was like $15,000 before uh, you know inflation these days. And then on top of that, he has to have an orgasm every day for the rest of his life uh, to the extent that he still wants children. Every day, he has to do that. Or the repairs they did that undid the vasectomy will heal back over, they'll scar back over, and then he's back to ground zero with it. So it's like the idea that it's even reversible is delusional. Like it's super painful and you don't want it. And then you have to you have to bust a nut every day forever. This is what his doctor told him, or it's going to heal right back over and you're screwed. And what he did will be for nothing in vain. Yeah, and I wonder if, if these guys like Pearl and Rolo would say, well, the reason they're recommending... Uh, vasectomy is because it's reversible and okay sometimes a little bit but yeah you don't you don't count on that Um, yeah and that's why doctors won't even do it if you're under 25 because you they'll tell you oh it's going to be painful and it's going to cost you 20 grand if you want to undo it later but at 23 years old you're not thinking long term like that your brain's not even done developing at that age you can't you can't understand think long term well anyway at that point but so what, give me a ray of sunshine here. Is is the manosphere headed in any kind of good decision in any direction where we can have good conversations again? I hope so. I don't. Maybe maybe the uh, maybe you have to hit rock bottom before things can bounce up. Kind of like a ball bouncing. It's got to go all the way down and hit something before it bounces back up. So yeah, I'd say it's gotten pretty bad the past couple of years, but I think it might have a bright future still. Maybe this was inevitable too with the manosphere as it encountered. It's really hit mainstream the past like eighteen months between Andrew Tate, Kevin Samuels, all this kind of stuff. It's really gotten a lot of attention. Never mind what we did with Make Women Great Again in 2020. It was kind of the first wave of that. Um, but yeah, I think it might have a better future. And right now it's just going through a growing pain and a growing phase. And my hope is that that's natural, that it gets super stupid and super goofy right now. But maybe those guys will burn out. That's been my experience is a lot of these charlatans don't have the, they don't have the willpower to stick around long term because they don't really care. There's, their values are not aligned with what they're talking about. It's all BS. They're just saying stuff that's, you know, whatever they can do to catch the waves of social media and stuff and go viral to basically cash out and then get banned and then cash out again and then, you know, do all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, these people, they're not going to stick around. People think that they will. They have a big channel. They have a million subscribers. They'll be here forever. And That's not how YouTube works. I've seen a lot of guys with millions of subscribers burn down, go bankrupt, go out of business, and they're, they're gone. These are YouTubers from 10 years ago that were big in their day. Uh, Six Pack Shortcuts, Mike Chang is a good example. He was huge on YouTube. The, the big Asian guy on steroids, right? I'm Mike Chang. I'm your buddy. And I teach you how to get six pack abs. And in the end, he has nothing. His company went somehow had these major problems. It went bankrupt. It was taken from him. The channel collapsed, like all this kind of stuff. And with a lot of these people that are getting demonetized and banned and just giving up and just goofing off. Yeah, so I, th- I don't know where I'm going with this kind of ranting, but I think a lot of these goofballs will just kind of screw off over time. And in the end, uh, you'll have better voices kind of like spring up. Like your friend yeah, Orion yeah. Uh, blowing up is a really good example of that. Yeah, I, I hope that more voices like his come along. Um, I don't know if he'd call himself a member of the Manosphere. I don't know if I am or not, but it's it's certainly yeah. a message that appeals to to men. So yeah, and he's, yeah, he's well-spoken and articulate and thoughtful. Well, he's a critic of it at the very least and very well aware of it. And that to me is close enough. I'm sure a feminist at the New York, at some New York Times would gladly stick you as a member of the Manosphere. And what do you do? Like, oh, I'm not. Like, well, you are. There's, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, feminism is very similar. It's an extremely loosely organized movement and ideology. Like, who's a feminist and who's not? Because you have a lot of conservative women that would say that they're not, but then they espouse ideas and beliefs that are very much uh, aligned with feminism traditionally, and they're just blissfully unaware of it. Yeah, feminism is an interesting thing. Um, I, I have this theory that you, you ever hear the story of that um, that Japanese soldier after World War II? He was on an island by himself, and he didn't know that the war was over. And so, mm-hmm. thirty years later, he he still thinks he's on this island. He still thinks we're at war, and he so many people told him, "Hey, we're not at war." And he said, "Well, I'm going to need to talk to somebody from the high command because I never got the word right." So he's on this island. He's still fighting World War II in 1970. And um, I think that's sort of what happened with feminism, where you had some things that that feminism wanted to change, and some of them I think needed to change. Um, and then 
the war was over and all the reasonable people, all the reasonable women went home. And so what you're left with is a bunch of weirdos who are still fighting the war from 40 years ago. And yeah. Or and, longer, or longer, yeah, or longer. Yeah, they're fighting a war from the 1800s. It doesn't need to be fought anymore. And so, the only ones that want to hang around these weirdos are other weirdos. And I think that's what doctrinaire feminism has become. Now, most people who call themselves feminists, they don't know that they're talking about this postmodernist I, I philosophy. They don't know that they're talking about the zero sum game, and you know, the men and women being opposed. They think they're just talking about men and women having equal rights and responsibilities. That's what the feminist next door, I think, means when she calls herself a feminist. But the well, I don't know about the campus. the responsibilities part. I would probably I would remove yeah. that part. It's okay. Usually, yeah, it's equal, equal rights. rights. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's fair. Yeah, um, yeah, but that's not what's taught on campus. On campus, it's this militant ideology, and there are a bunch of yeah. just deranged weirdos. I don't know why anybody wants to hang out with them. I've actually thought about this is interesting because I have a similar take on it, but it's a little bit different too. And it's that feminism was. Uh, some people like Janice Fiamengo, Professor Janice Fiamengo, Steve mm -hmm. Brule, and others that uh, uh, analyze and criticize the history of feminism, um, what it really is versus how it's presented today, and the, the kind of huge gap of ignorance between the two. So their view is that feminism has always had toxic uh, ideas in it. And that, so basically, it was never some pure movement from the beginning. Maybe it was a lot less bad. And I would say that's true from 150 years ago. Uh, you certainly didn't see, uh, I would call chicks with dicks uh, and all this stuff today. The gender ideology that's taken over it, the hardcore stuff, the trans stuff, like this has really gotten out of control. It's teaching weird. young, teaching young girls that they should get a double mastectomy at age yeah. 12. Like this is yeah. ludicrous is insanity. And this is what I need just to interject yeah. real quickly. This is the next thing I need to yell at the APA about because they're, they're completely on board with mutilating children. Um, but anyway, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. I'm all about that. Let me know when the video is ready. Um, but my point, what I've been thinking about is that feminism, uh, at the very least, it was never perfect, but it was probably a lot less toxic 150 years ago and even 100 years ago and 50 years ago and all that kind of stuff. So I think it uh, it gradually and maybe at some points exponentially at certain thresholds, it got more toxic over time. And I've asked myself why that is, because the manosphere is still like a young movement. At best, it's like 25, 30 years old. And I've seen it go from 2005 when I found it to more stupid and more goofy and more cartoonish over time. And it was not a smooth transition. Like I didn't just observe this every day. Like, oh, it's 1% like goofier and stupider today. But at certain threshold, you kind of realize or certain after a certain amount of time goes by, like this has really gotten more retarded. Like this is not a movement that's getting better. It's getting worse over time, like entropy. Like it's actually, you know, dissolving into chaos. But my thinking is that one of the reasons, one of the risks of the manosphere going forward is that there's not enough pushback on frauds. And this is what motivates me in part, mm -hmm. to push back on the goofy, stupid, delusional, pseudoscientific crap, the cults, the this, the that, the fraud, the deception, the lies. And I think feminism basically didn't have that either. And maybe that's one of the reasons why it got so toxic over time. Like 100 years ago, it was quite a bit better than what it is now. And how did it get to where it's at now? Nobody spoke up. Or the, yeah. the, this, the same people, like you said, left the room. They won some little war and they left. And what you had left over were people building bureaucracies and these fake nonprofits right, chasing ghosts. Like the patriarchy is, is a big ghost. It's going to get you. It's the boogeyman. And meanwhile, we live in something closer to a soft uh, matriarchy or a gynocracy.